You know, when you talk about a deer's senses, a lot of people think it's deer's nose is the most important. But I say its eyes are more important because they can see all directions. A deer's ears can hear all directions. Its nose can only smell what is blowing towards it. We're going to talk about the wind, how it affects your scent, how it affects a deer's nose. We're also going to talk about this subject of hunter harassment. Talk to a couple of outfitters who went through a grueling experience and a hunter from Michigan who went through that. Talk about hunter harassment and a lot more. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. A deer's nose is extremely important to its survival. There's no doubt about that. But I contend that the effectiveness of a deer's nose is vastly overrated by hunters. I believe that a deer's eyes and its ears will catch you more often than its nose. Let's take a look at my opening day 1989 deer hunting situation. In fact, I'm going to draw it here for you. Now, here's the field we were hunting. It was about a five acre field surrounded by woods. Now, there's a big swamp over here and the deer tended to come in from the west. John Ford and I, with the camera, were set in a pine tree about right here towards the east end, and this was on the north. Now, the wind was also blowing from the north, but it was about 125 yards to the south end. There were some big pine trees over here. And at daylight, I went to the south end and about right there deposited two quarts of urine. Now, this was human urine, proven to be as effective a deer attractor as any so-called deer urine sent on the market. Most of them, I found out recently, are either synthetic urine or cow urine. Very little actual deer urine is sold, even though it's all advertised or implied that it's deer urine. Your own is a heck of a lot cheaper. Actually, urine isn't really good at attracting deer, but under the right circumstances, it will hold a buck momentarily if it stumbles across it. Now, this is the problem with scents. Deer usually have to stumble across them because of the wind. Now, if the wind is blowing from the north, how will a deer coming from the west or the east be able to smell it, even if it's extremely powerful? The answer is, it can't. But to know what you're doing with scents, or where your scent is going, you need to know the wind direction. Now, hunters use many techniques to test the wind. Threads tied to tree limbs, baby powder puffed from a bottle, and this one, a feathered invention you can clip on a branch. To determine the wind direction, of course, you can feel it blowing towards you. Here's a little device a guy made called a game vane. Now, it just spins around here on this pin. It's a feather. It's very lightweight on an alligator clip. If you just hold it out, if I hold it out here in the, I can see which way the wind is blowing. It's sort of coming from the northwest right now. Sometimes if you clip it up next to a tree, well, it's, yeah, the wind is blowing along here in a pretty good clip. I don't know, maybe five, 10 miles an hour out in the open. But this gives you an idea of where your scent is blowing. And I'm gonna, clip it underneath the tree. You gotta remember, wind swirls around a little different underneath the tree, but I'll clip it right here. There we go. There was a problem with that vein located there. It showed the wind is blowing across in front of us or even towards us. That's because a big tree creates a low pressure area when the wind blows over it or around it, causing swirls behind it. That's what gave us the false reading that the game vein was pointing back at us. To be accurate, it really needed to be set away from those big boughs. Got an idea to try something to see if we can actually see where our scent is blowing. Well, these little smoke bombs you can buy, sort of phony firecrackers. I'm gonna put that right in the branch right there. We'll see where this, where the smoke goes. This will tell us where our scent is going. Okay, there's the green smoke. Look how it's going up. Well, that's good to know. Look at that, John. It's, it's actually blowing up and it's getting out there. And look how far it's spreading and dissipating. So the smoke actually disappears. Well, that's good. You get little swirls in the wind. But that's where, that's where our scent is going then. It's not going so far south. It's going over that way. Well, let's light another yeah, smoke bomb. This. this time, John Ford will tape it from the side. You can see that the wind is pulling the smoke from under the limbs, out into the field, from the north to the south. 
and the stiff breeze breaks up the smoke quickly, the same way it breaks up our scent. The smoke shows us exactly where our scent is going and how it's dispersing. It breaks apart and dissipates, which means that a deer on the other side of the field couldn't capture enough of our scent 125 yards away to identify us. And here's proof. Here he comes. Must be a doe. The deer continued to come into this field, sometimes six or seven at once, all from the west, moving along the south side of the field. Now the wind was blowing past us to the deer. They'd walk into our scent line, but it was doubtful they smelled us. The wind was knocking our scent apart. With all of our moving around, though, between me and the video camera repositioning, they'd spot us from time to time, stare at us, stomp a little, and then trot off. Well, here we are about 4.30. We're just about out of light for the camera. The deer are still moving in. I am just curious to see how the wind carries smoke right now, which would simulate our scent. So we'll see what the smoke bomb. It's the deal. It's blowing back our way. Look how high it's going. Look at that. Well, it's blowing off a little more to the southwest than it was. Now that smoke goes down. Huh. Interesting. Well, it spreads out there and it's, it's angling more that direction. Now that direction the wind was blowing, that's the direction the deer were, if you'll remember. They were walking along the south side of this open field in front of these pines. Now, the next day, the wind was still blowing from the north, but we set our blind in the southwest corner, right here under another pine tree. Now, our scent would be carried to the south, we figured, and wouldn't spook many deer, if any. Now, my son Zach was hunting on the north side of the field, right about here in a canvas blind, and the deer liked to come out the corner between our blinds right here and they frequently did. We had a number of does and fawns come out there, feed between us, never once scenting Zach or spooking because of him. He was totally hidden, but John and I were a little more out in the open, and I did such things as, oh, change my socks when the deer were in front of us, and this moving around, not our scent, caught the attention of the deer. They'd see motion, I'm sure they'd occasionally hear us, then they'd trot off, but it was not our scent. The wind is basically blowing from the north to the south, although at the end of this field with these trees here creating different low pressure areas, it swirls all around. I'm gonna try one of our smoke bombs here to see what it's like out on the edge of the field. Now this is yellow smoke. Oh look, <laughs> it's blowing to the northwest. Now that's unusual. Now it's swirling around, now, now it's blowing to the south. Now back to the northwest. Well, that's what's happening with our scent. Now it's blowing towards us here, towards the west. Huh, interesting. Well, now let's try one in the tree because this is where our scent is. Let's see where it goes. There we go. Huh. Oh, it's coming right, right at us. That's interesting. It's blowing to the west and to the north. Hmm. Now back to... <laughs> well, this does give us an idea of where our scent is blowing. In other words, all over, which means it's going to dissipate fairly quickly. 
and it's not going to reach out very far. I think a deer can come relatively close to us and it's not going to get our wind. Might pick up a bit of sulfur odor though. <laughs> a deer's nose is good, like I said at the beginning, but it has its limitations. In order for the deer to smell you, it has to be close, usually within 50, no more than 100 yards, and very important, it has to be downwind. The same principle applies to commercial hunting scents. If the deer doesn't approach from downwind and isn't close, it'll never smell the scent, no matter how powerful it is. Scent doesn't go all over the woods, it goes where the wind carries it. The farther it blows, the more it dissipates until it's so weak the deer can't identify it. Use the wind to your advantage to carry your scent away. That's the best way you as a hunter can fool a deer's nose. Keeping your scent away from bears is important too, and Ron LeClaire, who you've seen shooting his longbow many times on Michigan Outdoors, had all conditions right for this 300-pound black bear that he took on a spring hunt in Ontario. What makes him kind of special is I took him with an all-wood Osage longbow and a wooden arrow. Uh, nothing real exciting about bear hunting except watching a pile of rotten meat, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> Usually. Nothing exciting about bear hunting. You can't tell me that. I don't care how long you've hunted bear. That, when, the, when it gets that the hair doesn't stand up on the back of your neck. When, when it gets exciting in. is when you see that bear start to come in and circle the bait. Then it, then it starts getting exciting. I think uh, the main thing about bear hunting that everybody ought to remember, especially hunting with a bow, is to wait for that opportunity when that bear gives you the perfect shot. Wait till he gets on the bait, gets committed to the bait, gives you the perfect shot, and then make the perfect shot and I got lucky. Other than that, you have the bear hunter's nightmare, a bad shot at a bear at close range. Right, right, and then, uh, then you gotta track him. Or he tracks you, <laughs> yeah. one of the yeah. two. Yeah. Ron LeClaire from Potterville taking the longbow challenge and becoming our Michigan Outdoors Longbow Hunter of the Week. I've often been asked by hunters what they should do if they encounter animal rights activists harassing them in the woods as they're hunting. Well, I tell them what happened back in 1979 to 1981 in British Columbia when Greenpeace was harassing hunters back in the mountains. Dick Melke from Clarkston was one of those hunters and he told me in a 1982 TV interview how he handled it. So there were the two of you there in your hunting camp and how many of the Greenpeace people? Uh, there was about a dozen of them, but there was always about eight of them would be come at a time to our campsite, and they would all sit, you know, around uh, the campsite at different angles. Everybody had a camera or a tape recorder, and they were constantly taking pictures or taping your, your voice, and of course they usually have one person harassing you. Yeah. Like, like harassing you in what way? Oh, they'd ask you, uh, what the hunting, does this make you feel like a big man here out hunting these poor little animals? Uh, is your uh, love life at home uh, not up to par? Is this what you're trying to do is prove yourself? A... Well, how did you respond to them? We kind of laughed at them, Fred. Just kind of ignored them and laughed at them. And, and uh, of course, this made them matter because they didn't get the response that they really wanted out of us, and that was to shout back at him and but how could you live with this for 21 days in a campsite that's supposed to be back in the wilderness when you pay ten thousand dollars for a 21 day hunt you uh, bite your tongue many many times because you know like i say that what was in back of their mind was the fact that they wanted you to swing on them hit them that way they could have you arrested and then uh, they could have the RCMPs come in and of course they'd arrest you for assault and battery and they'd give you a hard time for the next two or three weeks and after your hunt was all over with, why then just drop charges. So we kind of figured that out between ourselves and said, well, we'll bite our tongue and show them that sportsmen are nice, gentle people. <laughs> Dick Melky for sure is a gentle person to be able to put up with that for three weeks. But here are two fellows, Ray and Reg Collingwood, the outfitters who were out there in British Columbia, who have put up with this for three years, until one day last summer, when it all came to a head and uh, the Greenpeace people 
left. It was a violent confrontation that you guys were afraid of. Your hunters had been intimidated for three years. But you were concerned about being arrested? Lawsuits? Um, there was that concern, all right, but, uh, you know, we had approached the RCMP and uh, That's the, the Royal government. Canadian Mounted Police. Right, and uh, asked them to, uh, the government, to bring legislation, and they weren't getting on with it. And uh, the police, there was nothing they could do, and they had this uh, lady uh, to the point of hysterics and crying, and um, okay, 25 miles from the middle of nowhere. This was a woman from Austria hunting with her husband. Well, you were there, Reg, you handled the horses on those hunts out there. What, what was the state that day? What was the condition of things? Okay, the, the lady is over 60 years old, and she didn't come over here to see me get in a battle with over these people, and I tried to avoid it as much as possible, but she was really scared, and she was crying, and she wanted to go home, and this was her second day and she had traveled all the way from Austria. So I got hold of Ray on the radio. I said, I've gone now, this is my second day. I've traveled, we're at the end of this uh, canyon. I says, I'm not going anymore. I says, we're gonna deal with this. And this so, something's gotta be done. So bring some guides and let's have a little chat with these Greenpeace fellows. Well, we should explain that this isn't harassment like signs and posters and, you know, don't hunt you meanies. I mean, it's like, what, locker room talk? That's right. Well, Lewd language, uh, stuff that we can't even begin to talk about here. And they were organized. I mean, they, how many of them were there out there? Well, at times in the years, up to 22. 22 at a time. And they had, uh, as I understand it, airplanes? Airplanes, helicopters. Two-way radios. That's right. And wherever you went, you tried to hide and, and get away from them, they somehow would find you and follow you, bugging you the whole way. Yes, yeah, a number of times, because I knew the area, I was successful to, to avoid any confrontation. Mm -hmm. But after three years, uh, they began to figure out, and they had obtained maps where the trails and everything were. Now, on this day, don't mean to cut you off here, Reggie, but on this day, when the confrontation came, um, the woman was crying, Reg said he had had it, you flew in with the guides, what happened? Yeah, I brought in one of our pilots and one of my other guides, and I said to them, it's time to hit the road. You know, uh, to, uh, these, this Austrian had got a, a fine sheep, an 11-year-old specimen, and they had, uh, were wanting to photography uh, at that time, but they kept persisting on them, and I told them to hit the road, and they told me in so many words to get lost, and... Uh, well, that's a gentle way of putting it. It erupted into a fight, five Greenpeace versus four Collingwoods. Uh, five Greenpeace were down, Collingwood still standing. That's the long and short of it. But since that time, Greenpeace has not been back. It's something you guys, I gotta congratulate you. As sportsmen, we're proud of what you didn't do in the peacefulness and avoiding confrontations. And I wanna tell you as an editorial, I'm proud of what you did. I mean, it's time that if the Mounties and the police aren't going to do something about it. You know, I don't promote vigilanteism, but hey, us sportsmen have had it with this. And I hope the Greenpeace people and other people who want to harass sportsmen get the message. That was videotaped back in 1982. And here we are in 1990, possibly faced with the Humaniacs or animal rights activists using these terrorist tactics against hunters again. What should we do? Well, I've sort of tempered my approach nowadays. I don't recommend pounding them into the ground this year, mainly because of a Gallup poll that was done recently of Americans over 18 years old that surprisingly revealed that 89% of Americans disagree with the positions and activities of animal rights groups. 77% said they disagreed with the anti-hunting stance of animal rights groups, and 90% said they opposed the hunter harassment tactic. As long as we hunt legally and eat what we shoot, it appears that the American public supports our right to hunt. If you encounter an animal activist in the woods this fall, I recommend that you get some identification, find another place to hunt that day, and report the harassment to a law enforcement officer. Chances are the tide of public opinion will turn against these animal rights activists, and maybe we won't even have this problem this fall after all. Now, speaking of public opinion, let's take some venison that we've acquired in the wild, and Kathy Beitler has prepared with an award-winning recipe. 
Jane Leonard sent us a recipe for stuffed venison loaf that was a <laughs> winner in our recipe contest. And you know, you wouldn't guess that something as as bland Blaced and ordinary basic, that's right. as meatloaf. But of course, she starts off tossing potato chips, chips. in. <laughs> that's different. Get your celery and onions. You can go ahead and mix up your just regular mixture like you would for meatloaf. And then this has got the croutons in it that you use in a stuffing mix. And you're going to add your butter and water to this. Now, since we've done this recipe, I have tried this with the um, stovetop stuffing, mm-hmm. and it's not nearly as good huh. as it is this way. This stays just a little bit drier, and it, it is better. Yeah. Then, you, you know, we're going to wrap <laughs> stuffing in burger. Inside of it. And win a contest with yeah. it. This is And it incredible. does work. And it stays moist that way. I think that the stuffing keeps the uh, burger yeah, from drying it out. Mm-hmm. It would. The trick with venison burger is really don't worry so much about putting fat in it, but make sure you have the venison fat primarily out Removed. of it. Removed. Especially the connective tissue. Right. Too many people take that venison burger, uh, you know, to a butcher and have them grind everything and up. And it does make a difference. That's a mistake. But this venison burger, quality stuff. <laughs> wrapped around the stuffing. It's a meal in one. Can you imagine how many people wished right now they were in Bob Garner's shoes? It's a good moist meatloaf. You know, you can't really you can't really beat it. I'm not really nuts about meatloafs. But if you but if you put in the stuffing mix, mm-hmm. it's this is, is really nice. You're not nuts about meatloaf? No. I would have never guessed that. <laughs> Knowing no. you all these years, seeing you eat all these recipes, I can't believe that. Well, what I'm saying is, is that when it gets to meatloaf recipes, they're all fairly basic. You've probably and eaten a lot of them. I've eaten a lot of meatloaf <laughs> recipes. I mean, who didn't? Jesus, when we grew up, hamburger was a staple. Yeah. And 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 so then you get to a recipe like this, though. It's got stuffing in it. It's a lot more moist. Change you know, your horseradish. Meal in one. This horseradish and the. And the ketchup, I think, is great. Yeah, just about any kind of topping, mm-hmm. it won't hurt it at all. Oh, I put cocktail sauce on, on mine. It's about mm. the same thing. It's really good. This is old horseradish, so you can use a lot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you imagine, too, the next day having a slice of this between maybe two slices Rye of bread. homemade, yeah. homemade I bread? I knew <laughs> he'd love meatloaf, and this is a great recipe. <laughs> the September-October Outdoor Digest magazine, which was mailed this past... Taking a look at our guide report for this weekend, uh, they're getting some perch down in Bowles Harbor here, 8 to 9 inches, 6 to 8 inches, and the cuts are on Saginaw Bay. Looks like we have a good acorn crop coming up for deer. Grouse and woodcock, well, our reports that it's been challenging all over the state because of the population and the leaves on the trees. Emil Dean has been catching as many steelhead as anybody, 3 to 5 per trip on the Manistee River. Salmon are in the rivers all around the state. Attention has been turning towards hunting in the Upper Peninsula where they've been getting limits of ducks. Whoa, except for bait and knock. Look at that walleye fever, 6 to 11 pounders. They report fishing interest up there is almost better now than it has been all summer long. If we don't have this crummy, windy, wet weather this weekend, get outdoors if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, you can join us for our duck opener in Drummond Island's marshes in the Upper Peninsula. Hey, we did pretty good. I think you'll enjoy it. We have a great recipe for duck breast and a lot more. So join me right here next week on Public TV. Fetch it up. Fetch it up. Fetch it up. All right. Successful. Girl, Pete, fetch it up.